How do I say this respectfully? I find myself in a simple sugar fast food environment where people can't watch a video that's more than a minute. Please join me in giving a big welcome to our guest speaker, Renee Rodriguez. Renee Rodriguez. Renee Rodriguez. I get most joy out of helping those bring their ideas to the forefront and showing them that they can have impact without being attention. <laughs> Sorry. There are a lot of really mediocre ideas in the hands of people who know the influence game. Man, that doesn't feel good. If you're going to be a life coach, how about get some life? First, I'm giving you the attention of my entire company. Don't f it up. God, why is Renee such an a-hole right now? I needed to hear that. So my next guest uh, has a bachelor's degree in psychology, behavioral neuroscience, and business. He runs his own conference, and he and I met backstage at Neil's event, the Ford event. We knew we had to connect because we share so many goals, objectives, and just ways of moving around in the world. Uh, without further ado, uh, Renee, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Chris. Big fan of what you're doing. And every time I tell people, hey, I'm going to be on the Chris Doe show, they're like, what? So you're doing it, you're doing it right, my friend. They're like, what? Who the hell is that? No, 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 no. <laughs> we know that's how they're there. You got a lot of fans out there, my friend. And so it's an honor to be here. Thank you very much. Now, we'll, we'll be talking a little bit about the concepts from your book, Amplify Your Influence. And there's so many things I want to unpack and just dive into your brain. For people who don't know who you are, Renee, can you please... Introduce yourself and tell us your story. And I just watched your TED Talk. Frame it for us, please. Well, so my, my background is behavioral neuroscience. I have spent the latter, probably the majority of 30 years asking the annoying question in the science community of saying, okay, so what the hell does that mean to X? Meaning, what does it mean to selling? What does that research mean to persuasion, to influence, to body language, to conflict resolution, to relationships, to dating what does it mean and i was never never wanted to be on the research side i understood it but my passion always was on the application side and so i sold cookware door to door when i was in college so i had a very strong sales background and did that and then left when i graduated went to work for a change management consulting firm that used brain research to deal with massive scale culture change in very hostile work environments so that gave me a background in, in dealing with the real side of change, not the rah-rah, emotional, adrenaline-filled side of what people think change is, because it's not, uh, and you know this. Change is nitty-gritty, it's it's hard, and there's a way to do it, and there's a lot of ways not to do it. And so then, over those years, combining, you know, being able to have a sales persuasion background, background in neuroscience, and dealing with real change, also then working with leaders, you start realizing that all of these sort of kind of compressed together, and I landed... Um, was pulled into this one singular focus, which would be influence. And that's the ability to communicate an idea that people will pay attention to and also act upon. The word influence is used a lot. And I think if you're listening to this podcast or watching this YouTube channel, you definitely want to create more influence and impact in the world. Not because it's a social vanity metric, but because you have an idea and you want to be able to share that idea. Now, in that talk that I heard you uh, share with the young students there, talked about an idea like you you were born you had lots of ideas and you started to ask yourself the questions about why some of your ideas were not well received while other people's ideas were like people would gather around them so maybe you can give us more insight into that story and what that means especially as it relates to what you do today the best way to understand influence is taking a philosophical approach and let's look at the opposite i, I always it, it, it's weird. I like to look at the opposite of things just yeah. to, to see if I can understand its opposite, then I can understand what it is. Like we know what good is. Well, I can, the better I know evil, the better I know good. Yeah. And so there's always this, you have to know both sides of an equation. <clears throat> if you want to understand psychology, you also have to understand the dark side of psychology as well. Right. For me, let's go look at influence, the lack of it. You walk into a room and no one notices. You tell a joke and no one laughs. You share an idea. No one seems to care. You sell a product. No one's buying. You cast a vision and no one follows. That's a really tough place to be in life. And you ask people what they, what, what word comes to mind, they'll say things like invisible, uh, defeated, deflated, sad. And I probably would venture that it all sums up to the feeling of insignificant. And so let's kind of dissect that a little bit. Because it's just so often influence is seen as this, this offensive strategy to sell something or persuade people, but there's so much more to it. So if I feel, let's say I felt insignificant in a meeting, uh, I'd probably ask myself, why am I here? and I'd probably try to get out. If I felt insignificant in a relationship, I'd probably start going, why am I in this relationship? Now, a lot of people feel insignificant at work and they start wondering, right, why am I here? And maybe this great resignation, there might be something in that where people now want to go somewhere where they feel a little bit more meaning and connection. 
And sadly, a lot of people feel insignificant in life. I would venture to say that that feeling of the lack of influence, the lack of being a cause or the, the cause to any effect in the world is one of the worst of human experiences. And so now let's bring it back in. You walk in a room and people notice. You tell a joke, people are laughing. You share ideas, people love it. You sell products, they're buying. You cast vision and you can watch people mobilize to take action. Now what's the feeling? Now it's a feeling of joy. There's a feeling of significance because now I'm doing something. And so then if we go, okay, if I know why I'm here, there's another way of saying that. I know my purpose for being here. And if I don't have impact, then I really have no purpose in being here. It's kind of a backdoor approach to understanding this question that we all wrestle with, which is what is our purpose? And so influence, significance, purpose, the mark we leave on the world, all to me is relatively in kind of in that same world. Now, you're you're probably the Pied Piper to people who are, consider themselves the alpha part of their group, the people who want to be leaders, the keynote speakers, the authors, uh, the salespeople. There's a whole lot of other people who are like, maybe I don't want that level of impact and maybe it's okay for me to walk into a room and not be the center or for people to notice. I myself have struggled with this. I used to feel very hot under the collar, quite literally, yeah. when I got too much attention. I, I just, I, I actually wanted to disappear for a while. So what's happening with my brain versus the brains of the people who want to do that? Well, I think it, one, that's a really great point, by the way, first and foremost. I want to clarify influence isn't about attention, like my gaining attention. You have to capture attention, by the way. So, but it's not wanting attention for the sake of attention, like holding your phone up saying, hey, everybody, you know, it's just not about like social media attention. It is a much deeper human function, in my opinion, right? So you, I also am an introvert. If I'm not working, I don't want to be the center. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't energize in groups. I energize one-on-one. -on -one. For me, being a public speaker, especially, I think that happened the more and more events I started doing. So last year I spoke 239 days. And you do that for enough years, you start realizing that you start valuing sort of the, the quieter time. For me, it's it's not about whether you're an introvert or extrovert. I know I do this more for if you want to ask my real purpose, let's have a real conversation. <clears throat> I don't I don't want to do this for the rich and famous. They already know how to be influential. They pay the bills for sure, but there are a lot of really mediocre ideas in the hands of people who know the influence game that are influencing people in, in the game is played a lot of times by people that aren't even that good of people. Right. But there's a lot of really good people with great ideas that have never learned how to get them out. And that's where my real passion is, is those people that are quieter, they're pro they process more, they think they're probably shy, introverted, but man, they have brilliant ideas. They're good hearted people, but man, they just, they were never taught. And so I get most joy out of helping those bring their ideas to the forefront and showing them that they can have impact without being attention whores. Hogs. Uh, and... Sorry. <laughs> you can say whatever you want. It sounds to me like the, the thing that's driving you, the bigger purpose from what I'm hearing is that you want to create a more egalitarian society and that the best ideas win, not the person with the flashiest smile or the biggest in batch or the, the richest or, or the, the biggest platform. And I noticed this in watching several of your videos, the clips that I was able to see online, where you coach people over, it seems like a multi-day event, and you can see how they start. It's like, you can't even recognize it. It's like, you can't even believe that they're the yeah. same people, but they look the same. It's their same voice. But first they start off unsure of themselves. They're stammering. They're inserting a lot of ums, ums, likes, you know, that kind of thing. And you're helping them through all that. It's remarkable mm. to be able to see, but then now I understand your point, which is, these are the meek, not the alpha types, who have powerful stories to share, can create tremendous impact in the world, and might have a better idea yes. than these louder people. So yeah, I, one, thanks for watching those. And you're right, it's it's sometimes the power goes into the wrong hands. But and I don't know, I'm, I'm thinking through. You asked a really good question. Is it, do I want to create a, a different kind of society where I wish it was the case? I don't know if I can create that. But what I can do is help those that maybe don't see their power realize that they have more than they thought. Help them also embrace the fact that unfortunately there's some rules that the world has created. And unfortunately the world does listen to louder, more boisterous people. Let's break that down further. Loudness and boisterous is a tool to be heard. There are other ways to be heard that doesn't mean you have to be loud. There are other ways to command attention without screaming. There's a lot of other ways to stop the show without jumping up and down. What 
we have found is helping somebody tap into their most authentic style. Let's look at you. So you say that you're quieter, shy, but yet you have a really loud style, like fashion style. That is one way to to make an impact on people, which is fantastic, by the way. I love it. And that's also a really nice way to stand out and choose saying, okay, well, there's a visual aesthetic to Chris Doe, you know, and then part of the brand promise is I know that he will always show up. He's not going to show up in a white shirt with a black tie, black shoes. He's just not. <laughs> Unless maybe that that tie is, you know, around his shoulder and the, and the pants are rolled up to his ankles. And, you know, maybe there's one uh, Jordan on one side. Who knows? But it's going to be different. You can expect that from Chris. There's a way of screaming without screaming. Like there's um, a book my mother made me read when I was 18 called Lions Don't Need to Roar. The lion walks in a room. We know it's a lion. We know it can kill us. But if a lion comes in roaring, we're wondering... Does it even realize that it's a lion? I mean, we know you're a lion. Rawr, I'm a lion. It's like, yeah, dude, we know. And it's like, well, do they feel insecure? They have to yell and scream. We know that you're a lion. Like, just how about just hang out? And that's where I think people confuse alpha, with uh, the, the the role of the alpha. This is a great conversation, by the way. It's like, so what what would you say the role of the alpha? Number one role should be to take care of the pride. I think. Yeah. So how? Right. And it's so a lot of people say protect, right? Yes. To dominate, win, and to fight. It's actually harmony. The harmony is what protects the pride and protects the pack. And harmony, if you look at even ape communities, it's, it's not always the biggest that's the alpha. It's the one that can get others to do favors. It's the one that resolves conflict. Yes, it can fight. And yes, it is dangerous. And yes, it can and has strength. But that's not, that's just one of the many skill sets. And so when there is disharmony, the betas get together and oust the alpha until one emerges. And the one that emerges is keeps sort of this harmony. And so I love that role of harmony, and that's usually through conflict resolution. And for that, I've got to be highly influential. And it, I, I know a lot of people that are half my size that have more alpha energy and capacity than I do. It's just size isn't it. It's just one piece of it. I know a lot of people that are twice my size that I wouldn't follow anywhere. Right. And I don't care what they say. There's a beauty in that sense of harmony and influence that is equal opportunity when people understand it. You are so unlike most of the public speakers I saw at the Hello Today event. You walked on stage. You were pretty grounded in where you were. You weren't jumping around, so this man is practicing what he preaches. You stood there kind of almost connected to the stage, and you, you weren't boisterous. You, you weren't jumping around, uh, throwing things at the audience. There was none of that fanfare, but what just came from you, a quiet confidence. And I'd love for you to maybe compare and contrast the different styles, because I know that you also work with other speakers that were on that stage, at least one of them. How would you describe that in your approach? Because I, I love this part. You help people find the most authentic style to themselves. And that sounds yeah. like that your style, but talk about that a little bit, please. Thanks for pointing that out. I'm actually in a, in a, in a, in a conundrum there, because mm -hmm. that is... My style isn't one of jumping around, but now I'm also an extremely intense person. When it comes to work and my passion, I'm really, 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 really intense. I think a lot of people have really mastered the louder stage presence and they do it really well. Some of them do it really, 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 really well. And there, of course, there are others that make up in loudness what they lack in content. And so there's an emotional side to doing that. And there's a success to that too, by the way. It's rewarded if, the, if you do bring that big presence there there's a lot of perceived value in the moment there. I was raised through the, the ranks uh, where my clients would not allow, they wouldn't hire you if you were running around. A lot of those speakers would never make it with, you know, some of my clients at Coca-Cola and, and Cargill and, and, and some of the more, what you know, I quote professional clients because they're, they're there for business tactics and, and they need some how, how do I do something, some internal change processes versus advice like, you should work on yourself every day. And everyone's like, wow, I write that down. And then they leave, they go, what the hell does working on myself mean? It was so emotional. And it made so much sense at the time. But when the emotion wears off, I don't have an answer to that question. And that's where we say it wears off. Well, it wears off because you didn't really say anything. You just yelled it. And there wasn't anything to working on yourself versus saying, you should work on yourself every day. But here are three things that I do. And we're going to do one of them right now. I want everybody to put a pad of paper and a pen. And so then all of a sudden now I'm doing the work or give them saying, so when it comes to working on yourself, here are three things that you can look at to decide. And here are three resources that you can look at, or here are, here are, here are. Or when you, you come up and I bring somebody on stage and I can talk about, this way we bring people on stage all the time because I want to take the theory into practice. And I'll hand somebody a mic and I say, who are you? What do you do? What makes you unique? And they go, uh, um, uh, my name is John and I'm, uh, 
uh, uh, social media uh, consultant, and uh, what makes me unique is I really care about my clients. So awesome. They say, okay, now John, it will, and so when it reveals, I don't need a PowerPoint to show what poor presentation style is. I just need to bring somebody up on stage who's nervous and let them be. They also choose their way into that, and I say, okay, so John, was that a one or a zero? And I, I, I rate people and influence on a zero or one scale. Zero, you're moving away from it. One, you're moving towards it. And he's like, uh, and I'm going, audience, what were they? They go, one. I'm like, you guys are liars. <laughs> that was a zero. That was a zero. And that's okay. Yeah. It's totally okay that it's a zero because I'm going to show you what a one looks like in a minute here. And John has it in him, but he's just out of sequence. And so now we're taking this idea of sequence and saying, okay, what does that mean? I said, okay, so now, John, you chose, you really care about people. So you let you care about people? I said, why? I said, what happened? You know, well, my mother always did. Well, tell us a story about your mother. I was like, oh, wow. So my mother, every Sunday would always, and she tells this amazing story about mother. We always take care of this kid down the street on Sundays and didn't know why, but she was always so caring to the kids and realized that her, her, her dad was in, uh, the kid's dad was in AA and, and uh, knew that he wasn't there going to eat. So she always fed him and, and, you know, just had all these influences about this. But the moment they start telling that story, they are in a very different chemistry. And it's such an authentic delivery and it's so natural and believable. And so that's what we call connecting to your heart versus me saying up there and saying, you need to connect your heart every day. And I go, yeah, I need to. And then I go, how the hell do I do that? Well, I'm going to show you exactly how. And so I'm, I, and this is, by the way, it's bitten me in the ass too, by the way, because, you know, we're transitioning into doing more webinars and doing more pitches from stage, which I never did. I was always about, let me tell you how to do something. And I'm going to, I'm a teacher. I'm like, I'm like, I'm literally going to show you how on stage, which is why, you know, I get paid a lot for it. But then you, the free talks where you have to pitch something, you don't give any how you talk about what. And at the end, when they want to know how that's when you charge them, which right. is a great business model, by the way, I've done it a couple of times and I make a lot more doing that than a speaker fee. And we, we have a pretty heavy speaker fee at 35,000. Holy shit. You make more money than the other, but it doesn't feel good. Right. And it doesn't feel right. So when you ask me in the conundrum, uh, if I'm being transparent, I am in that battle right now of saying, man, how do I balance those two? I always want to be like, whether you buy something from me or not, I want you to say that was valuable and I can do something. But then the consultants, the coaches on my head said, don't give them that. Let them pay for it. And I'm like, man, that doesn't feel good. So I'm I'm convinced, Riss, and I'm going to find a way to do both. <laughs> and I might lose my ass along the way, but who cares? I think you and I are very aligned in that and probably many other things that I want to make any assumptions here. We see people who sell very specific way. They follow the playbook. They value stack. They talk about the why you need to learn something, the what, yeah. but not the how. And yeah. they make them hungry. They they capture that high emotional state and they they pitch from the stage and they they close deals at the end of the day and they make a good amount of money, probably more money than than this other approach would for sure. But you and I, we're, I think you've already said it, self-identify as teachers. Like my joy in my life doesn't come from making more money. My joy comes from sharing with others fully, openly, without any expectations. And I believe, and you all, you have to like chime in on this. I believe it's like they're playing a game that is in quarters. I'm playing a game that might be measured in decades. And we've seen this happen before where somebody works and give, gives and gives and they, they're they like poor as hell or maybe they're, they're not poor. They're doing okay. But we're like, why aren't they super crazy rich? And then one day they flip that switch and that entire community and audience who's shown up for them time and time again who feel a, a personal connection with, they will then pour it back. At least that's the hypothesis. I'm not sure how it's going to play out, but both you and I seem to be on the same trajectory. I love how you said that. And I've been looking for a way of thinking. So I'm 30 years into this game. People ask me, they go, how'd you get to Wall Street Journal bestseller? And I said, you know, when I think back to it, there's there's a whole algorithm to making it work and you can't buy your way into it. I'd been, and I told people, I said, I spent 20 some years serving and delivering value without asking for anything. And and then when I came for the book and I said, hey, can can you guys help out? And I had so many people come, well, can I buy 500? Shit, okay, yeah, well, all right, well, then I'm going to give you this. And I, you know, I'd give them a $35,000 product of mine that I would normally charge for the purchase of 500 books, which is what, 15 grand on their end. They're like, this is all day. So we just, I'm like, okay. Now I ended up losing but $400,000 worth of sales right. to get there, but people were so willing to help. In that time, they were just calling and say, how many can I buy? What do you need me to buy? I'm like, well, I, I don't know. What You tell me what you need. And, you know, it's like, it was just really, really cool to see that. And I love that. And I, I, I would agree 100%. We are very aligned in that. And everybody that, that knew you before I knew you, that told me about you, said you guys would get along really, really well. 
even Neil, uh, shout out to Neil, Neil Dingra, uh, said the same thing. There is a long-term approach to this. And I get a lot of people that say, I want to be a good speaker all the time for different kind of questions. So I, I'm, I'm struggling, I'm doing this, but I want to be a coach. And I, and I just wrote, a, I, I would think, somewhat controversial article in my newsletter about the ethical dilemma in the rise of the coaching industry. There's a lot of coaches out there that are brand new. And you know, th there's a good meme out there that says, Lord, give me the confidence of a 25-year-old life coach. <laughs> And good mean, I've seen it. <laughs> it's not to rain on their parade, but it's it's you know you're you're if you're gonna be a life coach, how about get some life first? Go down some of those paths before you start doing that. And it's a, it's akin to giving directions in a town you've never been. And so if you if you are a personal trainer and you're overweight, maybe fix home first. I like I'm not gonna do a course on how to grow rich and thick hair. Yeah, I'm not gonna do a course on the menstrual cycle and what women are getting wrong. One, because I've never had one and that's not my world. And so there there has to be a sort of an ethical guide in, in this and there is no governing body about it, but there's everybody's a coach now and and that isn't even a get out of my territory. This is more of a get in your lane. And and I told this kid, he said, You want to be a coach? I said, I go, let go of wanting to be a coach and be so good at what you do that people start asking you how. Oh, and yeah. then you have something of value to offer. But if you stop it, I was even on a call just even this, this morning, they were saying they wanted to coach. And I said, you run a successful brokerage. Keep doing that. Don't stop. You want to be a speaker. Don't stop doing that because you want to stop to become a speaker. You're going to make more money in your brokerage. But what's odd is that you'll stop the brokerage to be a speaker, but the brokerage success is what gets you people to want you on stage. So don't stop that. You got to be successful at it. To, to, to lend to the other and we mm. can go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> There's an idea that um, I heard Alex Hermosi say from the stage at a different conference and he said something about if you just give enough value, the sales will become so easy that you won't even have to ask for it anymore. And it really ties into this belief that I have about karmic equity and that if you could just keep giving, eventually, maybe the other person's guilt or gratitude, I'll take either one, they'll find a way to reciprocate. I'll tell you a little personal story and then I'd love to hear if something like this has happened with you. I was at a, an Art Center grad show and it's just right after the, the pandemic. So the energy is funky. Everybody's still wearing masks. And this yeah. woman comes up to me. I don't recognize her. And she's like, oh my God, Chris, I can't believe that you're here. I'm like, okay, cool. I'm, in my mind, I'm like, how do I know you? Where have we met? And most of the times I don't know who they are. And she says, you know, I got to tell you something. I'm like, yeah, you have done for me more than this school has. The tuition at Art Center, the last time I checked, was $23,000 a semester. So mm. I'm sitting here thinking, I've done more for you for free than you have gotten from spending $160,000 plus at a school. And so I did something uncharacteristic of myself. I said, well, you know, there's always a way for you to pay me back if you're super grateful, but that's up to you. We have products that you can buy, you know? And she smiled, we all laughed, everything, and that was the end of that. Later that day, I'm on Instagram, and somebody messages me, I mean, I'm going through my messages, and says, hey, do you have a Venmo account? Yeah. I didn't fully connect that that was the same person. I go to sleep, no big deal. I wake up in the morning, as I always do, check my emails, the socials, and it said, Somebody is giving you money. I'm like, what? I can't remember the exact amount. I should know this, but I think she sent me like two thousand dollars, and I was oh, completely wow. blown away, Renee, because yeah, this is the truest expression of gratitude. When they don't even buy anything, they just send you money. For me, it's like just validation that what we're doing is working, and I'll take mm -hmm. that in any which way they want to give it. And if we can continue to work this way, all I want to do is just teach all my life. You know, I bet you that two thousand dollars felt like two hundred thousand. Oh, it it felt like even more than that. Maybe two million. Yeah, it's yeah. I feel it. that's a great story, man. Has that happened to me? Yes. And people do. I do an event as a favor for somebody. I've done that for a lot of years. It's harder now, but I've done a lot of it. And they'll come back and they'd be like, "Hey, we did really well, X." And I'm like, "Wow, that was really cool." But this, here's what I've learned too. And I also believed believe in the karmic equity and the and all of those things. But there's another side that I think we need to add to it. Let's go back to like Hormozy and some of the bigger players that are really good at it. There's a lot of times where people will tell you, you just have to add value, but they forget how talented they are also at business model. Like Hormozy is really good at creating yes. a profitable business model, is really good at the psychology of getting people to fall in line and follow a funnel is really good at asking for business in really good ways. And so it's not just, and I don't mean to say, because I don't know him, but I do admire him a lot. Yes, and It's not just adding value. You got to do the work to understand the psychology of how people pay for things. 
Okay. Because we also know when you give away things for free, they don't value them the same. And so there's a, there's a balance in there that, you know, I did so much free work for years and years and years and years. I'm talking two plus decades, hoping, well, this will come pay off. Well, it did in the sense in other ways, but I also had to go through the maturity of saying, okay, hold on a second. I have to know my worth and I have to be able to ask for it because what was happening, and this is the hard part, there was somebody paying for it the whole time. It was my family. Uh, and I realized that I was like, no, I'm giving away value, giving away value while I'm taking from my family. I'm borrowing from my family to pay for other people's education. And then that hit me really hard going, okay, I need to think broader about what equity means because there, nothing in life is free. Now, there's an ethic in terms of how much. There's, uh, there's gouging that can happen. There's things that, you know, so there's that moral compass and a friend of mine and I were talking about there's a there has to be an integrity alarm uh JJ Mazza if you're listening to this this is our conversation that that integrity that internal alarm that goes off of saying uh because we have a lot of things that accountability that's external we you know go to the gym you got to work out partners external but there's a lot of internal challenges that I think we have to be able to resolve and that's one of them so I think that there's you have to look at the overall equity of who all is doing it who's sacrificing time away from you like I owe it to my kids and my wife and and my family to charge what we're worth and what we've been creating so that, especially if I'm doing this business that has no a asset, I can't sell what I do at the end. So I have to be able to build something that if I were to pass, that my wife and kids are okay. Now, I'm not yeah. saying I need to leave them a bunch of wealth. My wife, I need to leave her the same quality of life. I had to kind of say, okay, there is a, um, there's a piece of the give, give, and give for sure. But there's also a Renee grow up and learn how to run a business. And mm -hmm. now within that, I'm giving and I'm running a business. Now do it ethically. And how do I say this respectfully? A lot of people that will tell you like life balance is important. They're also the people that are very wealthy, that unbalance their life to create the wealth that now go back and go, shoot, hey, you can have all that I have with, you know, you know, with life balance, but that's not how it works. And right. I've asked thousands of people this question. How many of you have done something big in your life? Great. How many of you did it balanced and all hands go down and it's like, right. okay, so maybe it's not, the goal isn't balance. Maybe the goal is in in integration and harmony. That's how I mm -hmm. think about it. I'm glad you brought that point up about Hermosi and that he did something good in his life, that he had enough money to do whatever he wants. And then he also built a different business model that this whole giving actually feeds into that business model of funnel, as, as you say. If you give away and you're not taking care of yourself, like the whole oxygen mask on the airplane, you don't have yeah, oxygen, good one. you're going to perish, right? And it's not that he's not giving. He is giving. But, and I think just a lot of people know they have to get the business bottled up. I want to just come back to this real quick. Um, you had said you came to the realization that it wasn't free. It comes at a cost. And it came at the cost of your family. How did you come to that realization? And and take me back emotionally. Like once you realized that, what kind of decisions did you make from there? So I think it was just looking at. So my wife and I, you know, the, the 239 days that I spoke, you know, people say, "Wow, it's unbalanced." I said, "Well, it's integrated because my wife booked it. You know, she runs the business, and it's right. harmonious because she said, "Hey, go play this tune, and I'll play this tune." You know, she comes on a lot of my trips. You met her; she was there. That was harmonious. But now, you know, in the last year or so, she's like, "Ah." I don't know if I want to keep doing this. You'll be gone this much. And I'm like, I don't either. So we don't like the tune. So there we go. Okay. So how do we change it? That's where we started doing more of the, and we're not doing, we're not getting rid of the high impact work, but we're incorporating. What I found was that there was a way to, to achieve both where we're giving, we're doing our free masterclass, which leads to uh, a two hour value added event, which I do show somehow. And the thing that I discovered was I can give you a ton of how, and then at the end say, there's a heck of a lot more how here you want to do that, you can buy into a different program. I think we we're, we found a pretty high integrity way. And the coaches that I have do this for some of the biggest names that you and I would both know. We spent, I put both of them through my program. So they go, okay, I, I get where you're coming from, Renee. So they get back and they're like, okay, Renee's program has to be different. It can't be gimmicky. It has to be something that if you don't buy, you still get value, but yet has to illustrate the immense value and endless journey of content that is also on the other end of this. And so yeah. I think we've innovated in a pretty cool way of achieving both of those. So we'll have to circle back in a year or so to see how the program is going, the, this, the transition that you made, the innovation and all that kind of stuff to say, like, looking back now, what would you do differently? And what, what kind of insights can you share with us? We have another friend in common, Mo, and I know yeah. Mo works with us, he works with you. And I was looking at your TikTok account with over a million followers. Uh, the question I have for you is, 
everybody would love to be in that position, to have that kind of social proof. What have you noticed in terms of the videos that you, you put out there? Any patterns where those are the ones that connect and resonate? Those are the ones that go viral. Those are the ones that get a lot of people to follow you. Because I'd love to learn from not only what you did, but what messages were contained in those videos. For sure. Well, yeah, and shout out to Mo. If you don't know him, follow him, Mo Ishmael. He's a genius. And he he was uh, one of the first people to tell me about you too. So I think that what he and I talk about our videos every day, he knows that I am highly hands-on. <laughs> so he, he loves it and is frustrated with just how hands-on I am. And so in terms of every, when we first started, it was like, okay, what worked, what didn't work? What do we like? We do another video. Okay, that worked, that didn't. How about this? And then we need to change the color. Oh, you can't read this. And what people don't realize, they're, it's, it, it takes a lot of effort. I mean, yeah. it's an everyday look at the content and an everyday saying what's working, what's not. And right now we're kind of in this little lull, I'd say. You know, we were getting, you know, 50 to 100, you know, to 500,000 views and some, you know, one of them got 25 million. And now we're getting anywhere from 1,000 to 12,000. And so it's it's an interesting time. But but we looked at it and Mo's so genius. And we know that if, if I have a hook in the front of it, meaning where I'm speaking to the camera saying, here are the three things that, or... You know, have you ever found yourself some sort of hook right. that it performs a lot better? And mm -hmm. we were doing a lot of videos where I just got really busy and I wasn't able to provide a hook for the video because we would do it, like a podcast clip and then we, I would record a hook to put in the front of it. That always performed better. My podcast, when I sit here and record and I just give wisdom, nobody likes it. And it's my, <laughs> I, my favorite stuff. No one likes, by the way. It's just like, I know when I'm not going to hit good. I'm like, I love this yeah. one. And it, my wife's like, right. we know it, and what, a hundred people right. are going right. to like it. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. And the ones that I hate are the ones that go viral. But what we found is that my audience doesn't like sales tips. The videos that kind of brought us viral were me coaching people. And so and if I'm there coaching somebody through a process and they watch a before and after, they love those. That's when we start going viral. And so we're... We, in fact, Mo and I had this conversation today where we're going to go back and just dissect. I've got 14 terabytes of video of me coaching people. So we're going to go back. I've skimmed through the content on, on TikTok and I've come to the same conclusion. So look at that. I've, I barely looked at it and I can spot patterns myself. People love role plays for a bunch of different reasons. It's because you can demonstrate what you've done. An expert is someone who's practiced something and you can literally see the before and after and your style. And I have to say... Mm. It, it made me feel a little uncomfortable watching it because like I'm feeling bad for the person. They're stammering their way through and you're like, stop, stop. Like they, they got a word out like Renee's killing them right now. He's just destroying them. <laughs> and so what we find in our own videos is the things that are elicit an emotional response from the viewer are like 10 times more likely to be watched because we need to know how this turns out. Either they love you or they hate you, but they're going to keep watching it to see. And, and that's why. That's why these deep uh, philosophical thoughts that we're like, yeah, okay, yeah, I'm sending out, but then you get 100 views or 100 likes and yeah. that's it. It's interesting, you said something about, uh, so one of our videos that I think got like 6 million, I started off by saying, I wasn't a Kobe Bryant fan until he passed away. Yeah. And then I learned his story and I grew to love who he was. That was the hook. It was the like, hook. it wasn't even the hook, it was just what I said on stage. Yeah. Right. And people lost their minds about me saying I wasn't a Kobe Bryant fan. How dare he use that man's name, get that man's name out of your mouth. We need to cancel this guy immediately. I said I grew to love who he was. I just wasn't a fan. I was a Michael Jordan fan. If you want to go viral, just talk about Kobe. That's another thing. It's got to elicit that emotional response. I, you know, it's fine. I've never approached it from that perspective, but I think, you know, it's what's interesting too, and this is, we can have this conversation. It's, okay, then I go out trying to elicit an emotional response versus let it organically come up. Because I see a lot of people trying really hard to do it, and it's embarrassing to watch like you're just trying to be controversial and you're trying to do stuff and i think the audience is also smart enough to see through that too i think they are and when you're trying too hard we can see and it comes across as inauthentic the other thing that i've noticed too uh, is that when you say something like um i wasn't a fan of kobe Bryant until he passed away then i learned to love him what you're doing there is you're jumping and catching trends and you're making your mm. content topical for a whole group of people who don't know who the heck you are. The metaphor I describe to folks is, think about it, it's like your knowledge, your experience, your wisdom, all the frameworks and tools that you provide, that's like a vitamin. And no one likes to take vitamin. They're, they're gross, they're, they're rough on your throat. So what do they do? They put them in gel caps. Or if they're brilliant, they make them into Flintstone gummy bears. I try to tell people, it's like, you have great content, you're a great teacher. There's so much that you have to offer the world. You gotta put it in this gel coating that people can swallow. And then they can get the nutrients that you provide. In that case, you're, you're newsjacking or you're trend hopping and it's 
it's not a bad thing. It's not an evil thing to do that. You're just making it contextually relevant to people. I needed to hear that. Thank you. Because it's, you know, it's funny, like I'm my own worst enemy in, in some of this stuff because I opt out of so many things because I don't feel the authenticity of it. But the news hacking in terms of that, because here it's funny, like three years ago, four years, well, three, four years ago, I wrote this, somebody asked me what I think of the state of the, the world right now. And I said, and I wrote this art, this thing for myself. It was like, we were going through a bunch of branding stuff. I said, what world have I found myself into? I find myself in a simple sugar fast food environment where people can't watch a minute a video that's let more than a minute. Whatever right. happened to actually consuming and sitting down and studying an art form and and you know if it doesn't capture attention right away, it must not be valuable. And I was just so I was so bitter uh, about how the world had transitioned to this sort of quick hit. I called it simple sugar fast food, but nothing is just mental junk food. I was almost then rebelled against it. I'm holier than thou. And then that's when I when I realized I'm like, okay, well, what if I could wrap like you said. I love that. Wrap good nutrients in it in the good tasting content or something that captures attention. And that's where Mo come, came in and helped me sort of see that. The thing that I have to bring up now is that those videos that I watch where you're coaching people, I love to see the transformation. There's a, like, I'm on the edge of my seat. There's kind of like some emotional anxiety that I'm feeling like, oh yeah, it, it's so rough. Like I can only imagine being that person. You come across a little bit different in some of those videos. And the part that people don't get to hear sometimes is you ask the class, the workshop that you're running, I need your permission to be able to kind of interrupt you, to be a little bit aggressive, to to grind it out. Because I think you said something about either discomfort or anxiety, that's where the learning comes from. Can you expand on yeah. like what you say and why you do what you do? I'm curious how I do come across from that perspective. But you're right, they don't see that this is some people opt, they, not some, all of them opt into it. I use a very stressful approach for a very scientific reason. So like, I'll get nerdy for a minute here. Okay. So. When it comes to learning, there's two types of things that we have to learn. One of them is called biologically primary things, and some things are biologically secondary. So biologically primary are things that we have to learn in order to survive. How to read a friendly face versus a dangerous face. How to protect ourselves physically in battle. Anything emotionally intelligence related, right? In, in, intuition to uh, connection and all, all of that stuff is primary activities. And then we have biologically secondary, meaning things that if we don't learn, we won't die but they're secondary to our success, like algebra, reading and writing. Anything that's biologically secondary, you can learn through theories, axioms, principles, and formulas. Basically school with a guide, which would be a teacher. And you can take a test because you read about it and you learn about it through theories and formulas and you test well, you can perform well and you'll retain the knowledge in a usable fashion. That's the usable fashion is the, crit the critical piece. So what happened is, is most often, our schooling system and teaching and coaching is designed around using biologically secondary modalities. We hear the theories, here's the axioms, here's the book, pamphlets to read. It's like basically saying, I'm going to teach you how to box. Here's this pamphlet. Read it. I'm going to teach you how to shoot a gun and get you ready for war in this simulator. Wow, you're bullseye, bullseye, bullseye. Well, I passed the test on how to throw a jab, cross, right hook, and parry a punch. But now I get in a ring and all of a sudden I got my butt kicked because I'd never seen a punch come at me. And there's a whole physiological response that happens that you can't learn in a classroom. You can only learn that by being in the ring. The stuff that I teach, when we're talking about being intuitive on stage and having a presence and being able to communicate under high levels of stress, meaning eyeballs, meaning a client that says, I'm giving you the attention of my entire company and don't fuck it up. In fact, deliver the message. I mean, that's pressure. And any professional athlete, any military uh, personnel would understand that level of pressure. They didn't learn what they did under uh, easy environments. Every one of the elite learned under the stressful environments. because So they studied, when they looked at people learning primary activities using secondary methodologies, 15% of them retained the knowledge. So they go, okay, let's look at the 15%. What was different about them? And so they zoomed in on that study and they said, okay, well, these people had a pre-existing condition of stress, meaning... I better learn this or my wife is going to leave me. I better learn this or I'm going to lose my job. So stress was this component to drive in a lesson that was a primary activity. And so we go, okay, so we know stress is a big component. If, you know, the same way, like I, I get, I talk to military leaders all the time. And I say, so when you learn how to shoot a gun, we're sure it was a room, it was air conditioned and Mozart was playing with big earmuffs, right? No, people yelling and screaming and, and bullets flying at us. And well, that's not optimal learning environment. Why would they do that? Well, we have to train to the level that we're expected to perform in the environment we're expected to perform in. Some people come to me already highly stressed. 
then I don't have to be really hard on them. In fact, what I'm trying to do is help them now manage it because I want to teach people that stress is not a bad thing. They say, well, do the butterflies go away? I said, no, but you can teach them to fly in formation. And so I've got to put you in that very uncomfortable environment from a place of love, and they know that I'm coming from that position. To then say, okay, now you're here, what do we do? And then we learn in that moment right there, what do you do when you're stressed? They learn about breathing, they learn about attentional narrowing, they learn about all these little techniques to get them really honed in and focused so that they can access the parts of their brain that already retain the knowledge. Because what happens under stress, that parts of the brain shuts down. And so if I can teach you those simple methodologies to get access to it during the times of stress, that's where we begin to perform at a whole nother level. It makes a lot of sense. And I see why you're doing that. You're trying to recreate the conditions under which they're going to perform. You're stress testing the system so if they can com- can perform there, everything else is going to be like a walk in the park, right? You got to use live ammunition. You got to use real explosions. Otherwise, it's too comfortable. I don't ever do it with somebody who doesn't ask for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what uh, the audience doesn't know because when you watch these one minute clips, I'm like watching like, God, why is Renee such an a-hole right now? Oh, and man. you're like, you just say one, um, you're stop. And they say two, two more words, stop. Okay. So you're going to let him get in a rhythm or no. So something magical has happened, but uh, please say what you're going to say. And then I'll follow up with the question. What we want them to, to understand is that what ends up happening, I've had people, one person went through this course 11 times in one year and wow. it got to the point now where when he does his talk, I would literally go and throw things at him. And one time I dumped a bag of candy in front on the table while everybody's looking and he had to step in front and continue his conversation and continue the talk and then he used the noise as part of the framing and one time i poured water on his head as he was speaking and i just whispered in his ear figure it out and he had to just deal with the anger imagine you're on stage and your powerpoint doesn't work or the lights go off or your mic goes off or you get a heckler when you're training the elite on this you got to get them elite level training now he's remember he's 11 times into it a big prop he was using wasn't working so his presentation was going to bomb and he turned that into a cool lesson and he came afterwards, he goes, thank God you did that to me in training because I don't know how else I would have made it out of there. And nobody knew it bombed, but we both knew what he was trying to do didn't work. And he just just turned it because he was able to maintain a really calm state. You just reminded me of this thing that I really uh, love and enjoy and that comedians do all the time. So before you're, you're going to sell out the football stadium, go on a global tour, you're playing in very small venues with a crowd that doesn't care, that's belligerent. They could give an F who you are. They're just there for drinks. And you're working in front of 10, 12 people. And you have to hustle to get those people in the in the room to begin with. And they're just trying material. They're bombing all the time, getting tackled. Yes. But that builds a muscle and it, it, it callous their skin. And so they're so good and they're ready. So by the time the general public's ready to see them, like, how did this guy get so good? Why are they so witty? I'm always wondering, is there a space like that for public speakers? Yes. And it seems like that's Lots. what you've created in a way. Lots of them. I try to tell people, if you follow the journey of a comedian, it's the best journey. Like, so I call them open mic nights. I said, you, and I use the same example. I said, watch it. Like when Dave Chappelle, before he came back from like when he was gone, he was like in Minnesota and he'd pop up at my buddy's restaurant and just show up there. He'd pop up in different clubs and, and he'd be hanging out with my friends, um, people that were nobodies in their houses smoking weed and he did it for years he'd show up in detroit and do this stuff and he was getting to know what the crowd what what was the world what was happening with the world getting reacquainted again right and doing open mic nights and you try out new material and i remember watching one of my favorite uh why am i forgetting his name um what he died he's he was a harvard attorney he was always on the roasts he was just one of the best roasters out there he's really really super smart but he was out there and I, I went and saw front row and he was doing all this material and nobody in the audience knew who he was because his jokes weren't landing. And he kind of talks, I goes, oh, he goes, nobody's seen me before. Oh, let me try some more material. And he starts going to these old jokes that I heard like 10 years ago and they just started hitting. And he's like, okay, well this stuff works. I'll give it to them, you know? And so he's like testing out material as he's going for what works. And yeah, I will sit with an idea before it hits a big stage for two to three years in that environment before I bring it to a big stage because they pay for an idea that isn't that has been vetted <laughs> it's you've got to test the ideas and sometimes your these ideas are wrong and they're not all that good and there's no depth to it and but yeah if you can test those ideas i mean rotary clubs free events associations create your yeah. own do podcasts this is open mic night. you and i are testing material right now you and i and anytime you get a chance to open your mouth in an environment where people are going to judge it there is an open mic night Give a toast with your family. Do a toast at a wedding. Those are all opportunities just to get your chops in and just do it as often as you can. And somebody asked me, as I was ta- listening to Joe Rogan, and he nailed it. How long does it take to create an hour talk? He said, well, it takes 30 days to create 10 minutes. So it takes six months to create an hour. And I was like, 
That's about right. I want to circle back to something. This miraculous transformation of the caterpillar into the butterfly. It seems to happen over a period of time. I think it's three days, but I don't know. What is happening in between the the the, the Cinderella moment, you know, and the the ugly stepsister kind of like what what has happened there? What are the key ideas, the breakthroughs? the things that you're teaching people that allow them to have such kind of radical transformation. There's a lot happening. So part of it to understand is my, my background is also in accelerated learning. So my mother was started accelerated learning in the 70s. And, and so I grew up around those ideas. And accelerated learning began with what they call liberating education in the in South America, where they were teaching, you know, adults how to read and write in a faster way, you know, to liberate them in essence. You know, so if they were stuck in a communist environment, education would help free them out of that or an oppressive environment. And so they had to learn really fast ways based on brain research back then on how to teach them. But now we call it adult learning. It's really just accelerated learning techniques. And so a lot of it has to do with stress and caring enough. We do a process called co-learning. Co-learning is real-time feedback, real-time correction. And so that's where the uncomfortable piece comes in. If you're saying ums, ums, like you're two ums in. And uh, uh, okay, you're fifth. Okay, good. Let's just start over. And then they start it. Okay, so now I'll, I'll make people learn how to walk onto a stage. And they'll just watch me practice it 30 times with them. And within the 31st time, they get it. Instead, they got 30 reps in there. Instead of doing it one time, getting feedback on a sheet of paper and says, okay, try to fix this. And then they may not get 30 more reps at that same walk in their lifetime. I'm going to give them 30 reps in about five minutes. And what happens, the co-learning is, I'll ask people, when, like, the, like when you're watching the stressful learning, if you're feeling the stress of someone's learning, you're also learning with them. And so when it comes your turn, you're going to take every single thing that you witnessed and you're going to incorporate it. Because of the stress that was associated to it, it ingrains into your brain. So I'm walking an audience all the way through this process. There's a couple of things that happen. One is that we create a baseline of what's happening. And so that's where we, we do a lightning round. Who are you? What do you do? What makes you unique? And let everybody fail. And we sort of establish this is the line in the sand, the baseline. We're never going to go back from here. And then two, each person does a new lesson that comes up. And they, we teach them how to tell stories. And so most people try to memorize their talk. But if I were to ask you to tell a story of something that happened to you, you wouldn't have to memorize it. Memories are memorized. And so we teach them the art of speaking from the heart, which is three things, your belief systems, your values, and your memories. Your memories are the only way you have access to your belief systems because those are formulated between the ages of nine and 13. So we dive into that time period because the things that happened, who was around and what happened become the foundational core of who you are. Then if you can learn to hit play on those memories, now, all of a sudden, because of the recollection of them and the authenticity of them, and you didn't write them down, the delivery becomes really authentic and very real. And then we teach them what we call Aristotle's rhetorical triangle of ethos, pathos, and logos. Ethos is your credibility, your character. Pathos is the emotional, the passionate appeal. It's got to be emotional. And logos is a logical appeal. So they learn to structure those stories within those three. But then they get practice doing it, and then they go to sleep because it's the first day is really grueling. There's new research coming out, and this has been around for a little bit, but it's uh, Huberman's made it pretty popular around a set of neurons that if you go to sleep and you have a sort of an intense day of training and you have an intentional change in mind, right before bed, these set of neurons has to do with the acetylcholine system, line up in essence. Basically, the moment you go to sleep, they go to work making change in the brain and making new pathways so that when you wake up, it's much easier. That's the, an oversimplification of what's going on, but it explains why every time we have sort of a, a, a day of learning and then we rest and we come back, that things move exponentially faster because of the prep and the priming that's happened the day before. They come back on that second day and all of a sudden, it's the, the things are clicking and they're telling a story. And we give them a very simple sequence of, of set up the frame, which is a story, deliver the message on top of the story, and then tie it down, which says, Here's what this means to you. And they use that methodology to be able to deliver that. It's an intense two and a half days, but um, the transformations are just really fun to watch. Well, let me cue you up to demonstrate this this idea of setting up the frame, the now, and then tying it down by asking you a question which you've already answered, um, but um, there's a good probability that people haven't seen this part yet. Renee, what is your favorite color? <laughs> so I was born in Miami, Florida, and moved to Minnesota when I was about seven years old and lived my halftime Miami, halftime Minnesota. And so I really never felt at home. But if I found myself uh, on a beach and I saw palm trees, and I knew that I was close to my friends, my food, my music, my family, and all the things that made me happiest. And palm trees are green, so my favorite color is green. Okay, now explain to everybody the difference between that and just saying orange or purple or blue. What's the difference? What's happening? What's the stuff that's happening beneath all that? This is what we call the question trap, right? So most people fall into question traps, meaning 
that most people that ask questions don't put much thought into the questions that they ask. For some reason, we feel compelled to answer questions that are asked of us, even if they're dumb questions. And thirdly, the person asking the question is leading. If somebody asks us, who are you, what do you do, what makes you unique, we feel compelled to answer that. And so if you put all three of those together, is that we feel compelled to answer questions and let, we feel compelled to let somebody lead us down a path that they didn't put much thought into. And so we have to sort of unlearn that. And we, be, we teach that through a stupid question like, what's your favorite color? And so we use that as a training tool to say, you know, I'll go around a room and say, what's your color? Blue, red, green, purple, yellow. I said, great. And then I'll ask a past student this, <clears throat> that question or they'll come to me and I'll, I'll give that answer. And they're like, okay, all right. So now the skeptic is going to say, just answer the question. No one wants to hear your story. It's a training tool. So let's put that context together. Why? Because it follows the pattern of how memory works in the brain. It's associated to a story and an emotional connection. And secondly, it's, I gave it, I told you a lot about me just because of a stupid story or question. And a lot of people will wait for ri for good questions to give rich answers, but they'll give stupid answers because they were asked stupid questions. So I say, stop waiting for rich questions, give rich answers, even in the face of dumb questions. And so that's like the art of even beyond media. You know, we get, the media will try to pin you in a corner. You still can answer the question, but in a way that serves your purpose. You learned about me, that I'm from Miami, that I like, that I'm probably Cuban and I like Latin food. And I didn't feel at home, so there was a lot of so there was a lot of turmoil during that time period. So you learned a lot about me just through a question. And so a lot of people that that we experience that way are the ones that we go, God, I just met them, but I feel like I know them so well. It's because they usually have more of a structure. So the technical structure is the mistake is, is avoiding the mistake that most people make, which is when they're asked questions, they answer in the here and now. What's your color? Red. But that's not how the brain works. The brain to make sense of the red or the here and now, we have to use what we call constructs of reality. How do I construct red? Well, based on past frames of reference. So if I were to say used car salesman, what word comes to mind? Snake. Snake, sleazy, slimy, all those things. Well, I just gave you a here and now, and right. immediately, without any context, your brain was forced to go to your past frames of reference, what we call and pull a frame that creates a narrative. And together, the frame and the narrative construct your reality of understanding the sleazy douchebag salesperson in front of me. If we know that that's how the brain works and we're constantly answering questions in the here and now without context or frame, then we don't know the narrative that surrounds that, that constructs the meaning and the understanding of what's going on. So the first thing we teach is, is to don't answer in the here and now, answer with a frame. I'll give you an example. So my grandfather was in Cuba. He uh, saw the Cuban revolution was about to begin and he knew that was not good for his family. So he had this bright idea to write a letter to the president of the United States and saying that if you get me and my family out of this country, I'll come in and fight for yours. So that letter somehow made it to the right person. And they pulled my grandfather out, my grandmother, my mother, and my aunt. He went and served in the American armed forces for eight years. And finally he got his American dream landed in Homestead, Florida. Now, if you've ever been in Homestead, Florida, especially at that time, the only thing that was there was Patrick air force base. So there wasn't much employment, but somebody saw my father saw what he did for this country, or for my grandfather, saw what he did for this country, and got him into an older vehicle. And that older vehicle allowed him to extend his reach by 50, 25, or maybe even 100 miles, allowing him to have better employment, make more money, and change the trajectory of his life, my mother's life, and ultimately my life. And that person who believed in my grandfather was a used car salesman. So now, did you have any sleazy negative thoughts about this person? No. No, because why? I went and filled the gap of what your brain would have done automatically, but it didn't have to. So I'm much easier to listen to because it didn't force your brain to work and pull some frames of reference just to fill in some gaps. And if you bought into the story, you uh, use that to create meaning and construct this person in front who seemed like a great guy. I just happened to be a used, used, sales, uh, used car salesman, which really was irrelevant to the fact because he helped your grandfather. He seemed to be a really good guy and he helped somebody who was a war vet. Wow, that's really cool. So think about like the job that we all do and how often we leave the gap what we call the narrative gap open for others to fill we don't know how they're going to fill it and so that creates a massive risk in communicating price value communicating your profession what your intention is and so that's that's i mean this, that's why it's a three day or two and a half day course it's just there's a lot of depth to it but a lot of practice as well so there's the here the now which is uh, we're hardwired it seems like we're maybe socialized or cultured in society and classrooms to give quick answers be succinct brevity is the soul of that kind of thing so we're, we're like we're, we're accustomed to doing something like that you talk about well absent the frame of reference we're creating too many gaps for the other person to come up with their own narrative their own story but by providing the frame, we tap into the emotional part, we give the context, and then we answer it. What is the tie-down part? The tie-down is the third part of what we call the Amplify formula. Formula consists of three things. One is frame, second part is message, and tie-down. So it's a sequence. Set the frame, deliver the message, and then tie it down. 
So the framing is the storytelling and <clears throat> using something to create context. Sometimes a frame is, a, is as simple as a prop. Sometimes it's as simple as one word. Like somebody says, hey, can you make it to the party? And you answer without a frame, you might say no. Or you could say, unfortunately, no. So that word, unfortunately, creates a frame and a more better narrative to understand that I wanted to go, but I can't make it. Versus just no. The brain is forced to then make something up. And if they're insecure, they're going to go, wow, he hates me. <laughs> right? It's almost like the Trojan horse. Right? The Trojan horse, what would happen? Well, there was guards up and they wouldn't let the, the, the soldiers in. But then they disguised a message. This was a message of death, unfortunately in this gift. And so that lowered the guard. And so frames lower the guard of the brain and get people open to an idea. And that idea is a message. So here's what I want you to understand that maybe our product is valuable or I'm the, I'm the right speaker for you at, at your event or that you should go on a date with me. Whatever message you're trying to deliver. But then there's a tie down at the end. Now the tie down, it's a very unique concept, but it's, it's something that people do intuitively already. And you do this already. I've watched you do it. It answers the question of what this means to you. And I would venture to say it's also one of the reasons why people love you is because you're constantly answering that question for them of what this means to you. And so if I, the, the example, <clears throat> the best example would be through the story of Janice. This is, a, I had an executive that they wanted me to, to prepare for a very big job interview. This is a, a billion dollar president position. And the interview is a six to 10 hour interview where she sits in a chair and there's 10 people in front of her and they drill her with questions. And so we did a mock interview and I put her in front and I, I look off to the side and ask questions or I just observe sequencing, timing, language, body, body language, <clears throat> facial expressions, all the things I look for. First question we asked her was, tell us something you're proud of. And she answered like most executives were taught, short, concise to the point with no frame. She said, I got straight A's my last year in school. Uh, they said, what'd you think, Renee? I said, well, since there were no frames, I started framing her because that's what the brain does. I said, oh, so you're, you're a procrastinator, you're fra straight A's your last year in school, so you're a procrastinator? You're going to procrastinate for us as well? She looks at me like I'm crazy. I said, oh, sorry, did mommy and daddy pay for school so you didn't have to work that hard? Now she's got a tear running down her eye. And I said, Janice, I said, I didn't mean any of those things. I said, but what am I supposed to do with straight A's my last year in school? I don't even know what that means. Like, There's got to be more there, but I do know it was important to you, wasn't it? And she just nodded her head. And I said, why? And she said, when you grow up as a kid and it's surrounded by adults that told you, to tell you that you're not very smart, you tend to believe and act that way and tell you that you're stupid. And so I didn't do real well in school. So I looked myself in the mirror my last year in school. I said, either I'm going to believe them forever or I'm going to do something about it. And I did something about it. That frame changes the entire story. Here is somebody who now was a procrastinator to now somebody who was abused and told that they weren't smart, they were stupid, but we haven't, she hasn't influenced us yet. She's brought us in, she's enrolled us, but she hasn't influenced us yet. That's where the tie down comes into play. So to understand the tie down, you have to have what's called an IO, an influence objective. And in a job interview, your influence objective would be to get the job. So if you were to put all three together, and this is what it feels like. Remember the first one was, Tell us something you're proud of. Straight A's my last year in school. Frame's gone wild. If you frame it, I told that was stupid. We're like, wow, that was amazing. She's a fighter. Who's next? No action taken. So all three feels like this way. Tell us, some, tell us, about, some, tell us about something you're proud of. Frame. Well, unfortunately, growing up, I was surrounded by a lot of adults that told me I wasn't real smart. And when adults speak to you that way, you tend to act that way. And I did not do it real well in school. But something happened my last year in school where I looked myself in the mirror and I said, either I'm going to believe them forever or I'm going to do something about it. So I went out and got the help that I needed, put my nose to the grindstone. And I'm proud to tell you a message that I got straight A's my last year in school. Tie down. Now, uh, Chris, I'm assuming that I get, if I get a chance to work with you and your team, that we're going to be facing some pretty big challenges, maybe some seemingly insurmountable obstacles. But if I get a chance to be on your team, I can promise you this, that I'll be out there next to you, if not out in front, overcoming those challenges in the same way frame that I did in my own personal life, except for this time, tie down for you and your team. Frame, message, tie down. Thank you for doing that. I've seen it, I've heard it, and I needed to capture it for our audience who are probably at this point like, give me more, baby. Give me more. I love it. This is so awesome. I want to say this thing because your your path in life is quite different than mine, but here we are kind of going our own way. And then there's this crossover where we get to meet in, in real life and have some very serendipitous conversations outside a cafe or something like that that's led us to this moment. <laughs> right. But it is fascinating to me, the similarities in which you teach the frame, the message, and the tie down to something that I teach, and I just want to share with you because it's just remarkable. I would love to hear it. Okay. I'd love to hear it. I teach in one of the things that I do, a communication module, where I teach people about how to say the uncomfortable things or how to deliver unpleasant news and things like that. I'm serving mostly creative people who are conflict averse, who are doing everything they can to avoid any level of stress emotionally. I want you to imagine in your mind a train. And the train has three parts, the engine, the middle part, and the caboose. I don't know what the middle part's called. And unfortunately, what most people do is they just say, you're fired. 
or I can't take this job. And that's the caboose. That's the outcome, the delivery of the message that you want. So we have to go back. We have to see like, what's the engine that's driving this message? So the example that I like to give is when you're ready to fire somebody, you have to tell them emotionally like what, what you're going through. So I would say yeah. to them, the engine is, I've been up all night. I've been thinking about this for three weeks and I'm at a point in which I don't know what else to do. But here's the thing, John or Mary, you and I have talked about this before and you can't consistently show up late and still be here. And I've warned you before. So unfortunately, as much as I don't want to do this, I have to let you go. There's a little bit of a quick story and then you have to get to the outcome. If you spend too much time in the story, they start to lose what, what's going on and you'll lose the courage to say what the outcome that it is that you want. So what we say to you, think about the outcome, the impact or the outcome that you want to have, the message, and then build it backwards. But don't just go in there and say, Yes, no, you're fired. I want the job. I don't want the job. I hate you. Just this little that. trick allows them to feel brave and courageous enough to say uncomfortable things. So there is some overlap there, yes? It's you're framing, you're delivering a message. And I love the analogy. It's like, it's so easy to follow, especially from, I mean, that's the beautiful thing is like, this is, this is all about, I, I tell people, it's like the people that are very successful are following this model in their own way. They've intuitively figured yeah. it out in some way, shape or form. I'm just labeling it in that way. And so, yeah. but I love that sort of three part series because you're really setting the frame and you're using an emotional frame. And you're also, <clears throat> there's a framing thing that I like in there is you're, you're, you're also saying that you care. You're starting with care. So you're following how the brain needs to, to be, to be able to reduce what we create, what we call psychological safety by saying, showing that you care. It's one of the first brain questions the brain asks. It says, am I safe first? And then do you care about me? You know, if I can show that I care, that's a really strong way of creating safety as well. So you kind of killed two birds with one stone. <clears throat> and so um, I love that. That's really brilliant. Thank you. As you were sharing it, you have the neuroscience, the psychology, the 30 years of talking about stuff like this. Whereas I'm, I've been coached, but I've just been doing it and then trying to explain to people how I do what I do. And like, oh, that makes it a lot easier. And the thing that really is difficult for folks is inertia. They're on the train track and you know, it's like thousand, however many tons, it's very difficult to move. And so looking at someone in the eye, someone that you, you care about emotionally, professionally, personally, and saying you can't stay here anymore, it's too difficult. So they punt and they keep punting it down the field. So two weeks, two months, sometimes a year later, they're like I got to get rid of this person. It's creating all kinds of internal conflict for them. But if you just start with like, here, here's who I am as a human being. This is the thing that's driving me. All of a sudden you start to build the momentum becomes a lot easier for you to follow through with what it is that you have to say. And I'm speaking from the patient's point of view. I've struggled with this for many, many years. No, dude, you're doing you're doing such good work, man. And I love that you're you're you've got a really clear community of the creatives. I have a passion for the creative community because of just my creative director, uh, George Castillo, is a huge fan of you. And so we'll give you a shout out to George. And he, he sent an email. He's like, I got a chance to email with Chris. I was like. <laughs> I was like, if Chris saw your design, he would be a big fan of you, George. He's George is amazing, and George is what you, the type you're talking about. He's very quiet, um, ridiculously talented, so incredibly talented. I mean, if you ever seen my logo, it, yeah, I don't know if you've seen my logo, but you'll see that um, the word neuro is hidden in it. It's ridiculous. I don't know how he did it and how he found it, but yeah, I just I think that the, the creative community can create so much healing in the world because they hit on things, they communicate things in such a beautiful way that can be lost in the business world, in the hardcore approach to things. But creativity is, and the creatives are the ones that the artists. It's just it's a they're they're a beautiful group of people. So I've been talking to Rene Rodriguez. He's the author of the best-selling book Amplify Your Influence. There's a couple other things that he's doing, but if you've enjoyed this episode, I want to tease the audience here. I think this is part one and we're going to bounce podcasts because eventually I'm going to be on Renee's podcast. So we'll continue these conversations. We'll geek out on public speaking, our mission Love to it. teach the world without being scumbag marketers. We'll see if it's going to work or not. I believe it will. Renee, what are you doing next? What can people get excited about? Uh, one, I look forward to part two and three and four. Um, so the <clears throat> we've got our AmpCon event coming up uh, in October 26th, which you and I should talk about. I would love to incorporate you somehow there. The at least just introduce you somehow to to our audience. I think they would be it'd be a high value add to them and a gift to them. So it's October 26th in Dallas, Texas, and we've got some pretty cool people. I don't know if you're are you familiar with Jefferson Fisher. He's you should follow him. So I'll give you an idea of Jefferson. <clears throat> he is a trial attorney. I'll give you an idea. Ed Milet is about 2,000 posts in, and he has about 2.6 million followers. 
Jefferson is 245 posts in and has 2.5 million followers. Every one of his posts are almost a million, if not 2 million in reactions. Wow. He sits in his car, holds his phone, and gives a tip on communicating. And it's really simple. It's really humble. He's really brilliant, and he's the most likable person. Anyways, he's going to be speaking there. Uh, we've got Neil Ford, who is was ranked in the top 10 most decorated creative directors in the world. And if you follow Neil, N-E-A-L-F-O-A-R-D. Also, I believe to be probably the best storyteller I've ever met. He's going to be there. We've got Rachel uh, Lambert, who is the president and founder of Brain Code Centers. And so we're, she, she has the biggest center across the nation with that does neurofeedback and brain training. Uh, I'll give it away here. Um, are you familiar with Clinton Sparks? So Clinton Sparks is uh, Grammy nominated, 80 million records sold, Eminem, Jay-Z, you name the artist. This guy either did the beat, was their DJ, or was the producer behind it. And he's a music mogul. He's going to be the face of, a, I can't tell you the magazine right now. It's going to come out in the coming weeks, but a magazine both of you and I know what really well. But he's a business businessman too. Uh, he'll be there. So it's a really cool group of people, very different. I didn't go after the the mainstream, but I went after the people that are doing stuff that, that you probably haven't heard of, but you're going to hear about, uh, or the ones that are just too busy doing things right now that it's a pretty cool audience. And I got some other really cool ones. Aaron Williamson's going to be there, who's the celebrity trainer for The Rock, Zach Efron, Sylvester Stallone. Yeah, he was in the movie Terminator, so he's going to be there. He's my personal trainer, so it's, uh, it's going to be some cool stuff. And maybe we'll get some time for Chris Doe up there. Wonderful. I would expect nothing less from you in terms of the lineup because I think you and I, we resonate the same kind of energy. There are the kinds of speakers who have accomplished a lot in their life but don't have a lot to share with you besides what we'll affectionately refer to as inspiration porn or hope marketing. Okay. We're both educators at heart and it, it drives what we do. And there's names here that I'm sure people will know right away. But if you trust the man, if you've enjoyed this episode, then you'll trust his ability to curate and put together a powerful panel, a curriculum that's designed for you to be uh, the, the most optimal version of yourself. Renee, it's been a real pleasure chatting with you. I'm so glad we got a chance to, to bump into each other at Neil's event. Likewise, a pleasure and the honor is all mine. And shout out to Neil for the amazing work he's doing and for bringing some good people together. And uh, for Mo, for you know, being the creative master behind a lot of what we're doing here too. So my, my friend, it's, uh, I wrote down inspiration porn and hope. what did you say? Hope. Hope marketing. Uh, hope marketing, man. Oh, that's so good. It, I've just, it's your reputation precedes you and, and being able to have a conversation with you has been just delightful and refreshing. And I am looking forward to the next 30 years together, having fun, even more conversations. Beautiful. I look forward to it myself. Thanks, Renee. Awesome. Thank you. This is Renee Rodriguez, and you're listening to The Future. Now, before we hang up, beautiful, with that deep voice of yours straight into the mic. Love it. Love it. Love it. You know what we need to do? We just have to have a conference where it's just bald men only. We'll take bald women too, but there are not many of them. It's the bald conference. It's the power ball. That's what it is. Are you bald? Are you bald? I am. Let yeah. me see. Yeah. I'm most oh, sweaty shit. Underneath. Wait, no, no. Let me see this. Let me see this. No hey. shit. Hell yeah, yeah, man. 